Hi guys, welcome back to A Different Life Story, my show on YouTube and as a podcast with me, your host, Stefan Neff. Today is a beautiful day for another interview and I've got a gorgeous guest here with me, Amber Miller, who is a drama breaker, a woman who has gone through hell and kept going and is nowadays living a life like me, that is so full of passion, so full of light, that's so full of, of energy that it, it's the, actually you need shackles to really hold her down because she is such a yay! And it's just, before the show, we always do a bit of a, of a banter back and forth and, and warm us up kind of a thing. And already in those 10, 15 minutes that we chatted, there were so many similarities Damn, it is, it's just, it's sometimes it's scary to meet people like you, Amber, who are just, just damn, it, it just, where have you been all my life? Because we are so, so, so aligned. And so it's weird. So Amber, thank you so much for coming onto my show. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah, like I was telling you before, like we are so much more alike than what we are different. You know, you're on the other side of the world. I'm in the Midwest of the U.S. And yet we've gone through so many of the same things and, you know, flipped our mindsets and are trying to make a positive impact now on the world. And so we do have so much more that's similar than mm -hmm. than we do apart. And, and that's just what I want everybody to experience. Isn't it? And and experience is the is the right word. Mm -hmm. I guess many of us know that these are the facts, but the moment you experience it, the moment you love together, the moment maybe you share food together or uh, talk over coffee, just talk rubbish or over whilst you're you're in the middle of, of the gym in between exercises, and you you suddenly realize, wow. There's, there's so much we have got in common and it just so happens that my skin is a bit different color than yours or that my religion says a few different things than yours who the hell cares um and that's such a beautiful insight it is it is well worthwhile to 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 go out there and and experience those experiences but well, I mean, we are already jumping ahead in, in time and, and, and we are talking about our life today, which is so beautiful, but it wasn't always the same, isn't it? Uh, it's my life was rather, rather different. And one of the things that, that struck me with you was the, the intergenerational uh, aspect of it, because you come from a family where alcohol is certainly not a stranger. Um, are you happy to talk a bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So my grandmother um, was an alcoholic and that led to, and, and she had my mom when she was 40. And so my grandma was already an alcoholic and then she wasn't able to take care of my mom mm. the way that she should have been able to. And so my mom was in foster care from four to 14. Mm. And that was really fueled um, a lot of my mom's trauma. And then after 14, my mom went back to live with my grandma. And then, um, you know, as the years went on, my mom, she worked hard and uh, she had me and then met my dad and, and had my brother and everything like that. And she worked really hard to give her life or give her kids the life that she never had. And yet the alcohol was still present there. Um, my mom was the most amazing mom, you know, growing up, but they still partied on the weekends and there was a lot of chaos. And then when I turned, when I got to be a teenager, she, and we didn't need her anymore, like as much, you know, we were independent. Um, then her drinking really picked up from there. And when I was 18, my parents got divorced. And then when I was 22, she passed away um, from, from the alcohol and, and just not being able to get over that. Um, it took me about 
10 years to um, figure out why that happened um, and and just to process that. But here I was um, drinking the entire time and following in my mom's footsteps. And so now I have a six and a two-year-old too. Um, And and now I've finally gotten over and passed that, but, and, and there's a lot that goes into that, but yeah, it's, it's just been this generational thing. And in all fairness, there is a strong, uh, no, there is a strong uh, link. There are genetic factors uh, that hand down generation by generation our superpower of having this massive dopamine release in response to a drink. And there are about 50 genes out there that people can have and and various combinations of these genes predict how much you are at risk. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I would say also that because you have lived the life and you have seen what alcohol does. Therefore, whilst you might have a higher chance of being an alcoholic and you might have even gone down the same route, you have actually such a strong motivator because you've seen what it does. You've seen the negative things and you have seen, well, your children will have that now. Your children will have the genes. Your children will be more likely in theory, to become alcoholics. Guess what? I doubt that very much. Because (laughs) here you are, because you are modeling, you're modeling the life that is possible. Mm -hmm. And you're open about the story with alcohol. So therefore, the awareness amongst them will be much, much different. So talk about life repeating itself. I think you have just taken a big screwdriver to the vinyl and that song will never play the same again, will it? So it's interesting because um, in in the last couple of years of my mom's life, um, you know, I was begging and pleading with her to get help. Um, she had no money. She was um, barely working a job and, and she was just living like a horrible quality of life. And, and my heart ached for her, but I didn't know how to help her because I was only, you know, 20, 21. And, and yet I felt like the parent in the relationship and I would beg and I would plead with her like her children meant more to her than anything else in the world. And yet this poison in a bottle had this death grip around her that she wasn't able to get past. And, you know, she would tell us how much she loved us. And yet I asked her time and time again, why can't you show yourself that love? Like, why can't you break the mold? Because she would, she would put it on me. And she would say, you know, you've got to be the one to make the change. And, and I kept putting it on her. And so, and actually I just kind of got chills. And so, you know, when it came time then to, I was drinking and I had my own kids and in my head, I started up that same bullshit story. My kids are going to be the ones to, you know, change, like they have to break the mold. And, and it wasn't until like, I started facing my own crap. Like, no, why would I put that on a six and a two-year-old? Like, why would I give them all of this crap? Like, here it is, hand it over. Like, why would I put that on them? And so I decided, like, I couldn't do it for my kids. I had to quit for me. But they have clearly been the biggest benefactors. And um, actually, this is this just happened two weeks ago. Um, we were sitting, my son was sitting on my lap and we were sitting around some people that were drinking and somebody had asked my son who's six, if he's going to drink beer when he gets older. And he just said no. And then in almost a whisper, he like looks up at me and he goes, 
because not everybody drinks, right, mom? And I cannot tell you what that did like <laughs> to my heart. Um, ugh, I'm going to get emotional about it because like I did that. I broke the mold for my children. I am giving them that example of somebody that doesn't drink in their life and not just somebody, but like probably the most influential person in their life. And so to know that I broke that, like I know that my mom and my grandma are just shining down from high heavens, proud as hell that I was able to do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Amen. I got a bit dust in my eye there too. I know, right? <laughs> and that is such like a beautiful it's thing. It's working. I did it. Like I I'm know. doing it. Like they are watching and I, and I did this. And and like that was just like, I just think about how different things could be right now. Hmm. Like had I not made this change in my life. So your own drinking how did that start? I mean, initially, alcohol is a friend for many, many people. Yeah. What did the alcohol give you? When did you start? When did you have your first drink? Because interestingly enough, here you are, you have got all these negative role models. Mm-hmm. At the same token, you are a teenager. There is pressure on you. And mm-hmm. let's not forget, there is peer pressure but there's also the benefits of alcohol so what did alcohol do to you so it was a monkey see monkey do situation um growing up around in the midwest everybody here drinks um that's what our parents do on the weekends Mm -hmm. and so by the time we get to be 15 and 16 well that's what we start doing we go and we have the parties on the weekends and so here I was in in high school, um, 16, 17, and 18, and I was always like an A honor roll student. And I had a job that I worked at least 30 hours a week at. So like I was a high functioning teenager alcoholic. And um, you know, and and when you're young, you can re like recharge really fast. So your hangovers don't do what they do to you as you get older. <laughs> and, and um, you know, my parents, they used to buy me my alcohol and um, it's, it's kind of like, I told my mom, like, I'm working and I'm getting good grades and mm. I'm going to unwind the same way that you do, mm. you know? And, and I didn't, I didn't know any different, like nobody else did anything different. And so, you know, having that, we were, I was able to let loose and like, I'm already like a pretty vibrant person. Like I do not need alcohol to like show up in a crowd. And, and so like having that alcohol, like just really put me over the top, but then it's, it never like highlights any of the crap that comes with it. You know, it's, it's the minor consumptions. It's the DWI it's, um, ending up like in situations that I never want to be in and I never want my children to be in. And in, you know, alcohol doesn't glorify any of that. It only advertises, you know, people having fun. And I always find it like just ironic that, you know, at the end they put drink responsibly. Like (laughs) who the hell drinks responsibly? Like that's such a load of crap to me. Like why don't you show the, the, the pictures or the advertisements of a 22 year old girl burying her mom? Exactly. Like, why don't you show the domestic abuse that, that comes with it or the girl being raped? Like, why aren't you highlighting that? Like it's bullshit. And that's why it's so important for me to like show people that, there is life beyond alcohol and it is an amazing one. I think the facts need to be highlighted here. 
you are up against a, a, a billion dollar industry mm-hmm. on your capital hill for every two uh, two politicians there is one alcohol lobby uh, mm-hmm. person the where this drink responsibly comes from is that there was pressure or that people considered to actually um, force the alcohol industry to be regulated and to to uh, have a bit more an oversight, so to speak. And they said, no, 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 let's do it ourselves. We we gonna we gonna look after it. So we'll do the right campaigns that people don't drink and drive. But then again, how can you twist that? and say, well, here we are, we are producing this poison and we make zillions of dollars from it. So we want to change, the, we don't want to change that. So, ah, I've got the idea. We put the onus on the people. So if they drink too much, then they don't drink responsibly. So it's their mm-hmm. fault. Okay, and we can just keep doing what we are doing and we are not being regulated. That's really what is happening. And you have to say we are we are brainwashed uh, the demagogy the the manipulation that is occurring on a daily level is scary and frightening when you look behind the scenes it is if you watch netflix every three and a half minutes alcohol is drunk or being presented to you in, a, in one way or the other it's a constant bombardment and you could say, oh, no, hang on, hang on. This is, they're not, that, that's just live. And, and no, no, there's, it is, there is no advertisement in there. So guess what? Um, a year ago, two years ago now, um, they have uh, a group of uh, UK researchers watched a lot of Netflix and watched another, uh, another uh, channel or um, producer um, as well. And they just had a look throughout the whole things and tried to figure out, are there any similarities? And what about alcohol in there? And it so happens that in Netflix, a certain type of alcohol seems to be rather prevalent. Mm-hmm. Well, it's the same type of alcohol that does not appear whatsoever in the, uh, the competitor, yet the competitor likes a certain type of alcohol that doesn't appear in Netflix. Mm-hmm. Funny that is. I yep. just wonder how that happens. Yeah. Ah, in, manipulation. In, yeah, and you don't realize how prevalent it is mm. until you take a step back and you look. And, um, you know, I was telling that story about my son to somebody else the other day. And, you know, we start conditioning our kids at a very young age. Why did that person feel the need to ask my six-year-old if they're going to drink beer when they're older? Why do we ask our kids to run and go get us a beer? Mm. Why do we automatically put it on them that they will drink when they're older? Mm. And, you know, when I took that step back and, and now it's like every country song, every song is almost got something about drinking beer or like, you know, mm-hmm. getting lit on the weekends mm-hmm. or, you know, if you break up and, and it's just like every emotion can be covered by alcohol. Mm-hmm. And, and so that's like where we just have to take a step back and just like really <laughs> see the brainwashing that's going on. I don't think the songs will ever sound the same again. They don't. You know, waking, <laughs> waking up with my bottle in my hand. Instead, yeah. waking up refreshed and having just yeah. done some mindfulness. Uh, yeah. I don't know how you would rhyme that. I know it's just... <laughs> Oh, there's, there's tons of ways to rhyme things. Like they can figure it out. Like maybe if they lay off the bottle, they would have a little bit more music creativity. Like, you know, things, things get clearer when you take away the curtain. Amber, we are onto something here. I see your (laughs) guitar on your right hand side and I know that you're planning to learn the guitar and and get good in it. Hey, this is I, I I can barely hold a tune and I can barely, I, I've got guitars since I was 12. I love mm-hmm. them, but I'm not so good in them. Who the hell cares? Come on. It doesn't let's, matter. <laughs> that's right. Like, the two of us, we need, to do a, we need to do a country song <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in a positive way. Oh, shit. This is going to be a challenge. <laughs> Let me add that to my list of things to exactly. do. <laughs> Let's play together. We can do that. Right. Yeah. <laughs>
Uh, but that is the fact. You're so right. You're so right. It is. And in all fairness, that's our parents didn't know much better. It was their life. It was the norm. So we cannot put nowadays insights and 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 things that we take for granted nowadays. They were not knowledge, you know, 20, 30 right. years ago. So we need to accept that. We need to, you can't look with hindsight. And that is the, the difficult bit for my children. Uh, it is they have got all the knowledge now from mm-hmm. uh, dad having having turned his life around. And mm-hmm. they sometimes come out with this quite self-righteous statements. Ah, oh, and it's between, it fluctuates between, wow, we are so proud of you and, oh, what you did when you were young, you were never there for us, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, it's interesting and you need to put things into perspective for them as well. You need to, to show the compassion yeah. to us when we were in the throes of addiction, when we were actively yeah. using, abusing whatsoever, because we need to, to show our kids why that was, how yes. that was, because the alcohol was, was numbing the pain. And, and I don't, I don't hold like any resentment or anger towards my parents for their drinking and the way that I was raised because they were doing the best that they could with what they knew. And they did give my brother and I a better life than they had. And I think that's the goal of every parent is to just give the next generation better than what they had. And they, they didn't have, the internet they didn't have all of these resources so in today's day and age if there's something that people want to be able to change it's literally at our fingertips Mm -hmm. and so if people aren't making those changes then it's just the excuses and the fear that's setting in on what's on the other side Mm -hmm. of making those changes and so yeah we can we can do, we can do anything we want. And when we know better, we do better. And, and it doesn't have to be, you know, one all in one day, you can take it day by day, break it down and, and make it simple. So you had your own challenges with the alcohol, you were drinking yourself. And you buried your mom at 22. Uh, When exactly did you stop drinking in relation to these life events? So um, I buried her at 22. And then, you know, my 20s were a blur. And I actually just celebrated one year of being alcohol free, December 15th. Congratulations. Thank you. (laughs) Um, And it was interesting because the whole time I've been wondering, why did she have to pass away so early? Like, why is this happening? And um, I remember thinking, like, somebody else needs to change these laws. Somebody else needs to fix this and do better. And it wasn't until... Um, last year in November of 2019, I had a high school classmate who was basically at rock bottom with her drinking. Like when talking to her mom, I seen me in her mom in, in the despair and the desperation. And I knew I needed to step in and talk to this classmate. So I basically had this classmate over for lunch one day and, um, I didn't sugarcoat anything. I told her that she was knocking on death's door. And um, it was it was about three weeks later that um, she said that she was ready to go to treatment. And um, the morning that I, I went with her mom and her sister to take her to treatment the morning I went over there, you know, she's in the garage and she's looking like shit like she's, you know, like she's ready to die. 
but she wasn't because she was ready to go and change her life. And, and I knew like in all of this moment that that's the reason why my mom had to pass is so that I could help her and so many others, you know, heal and, and get the help to show them the other side. And so It was getting her into treatment and, you know, providing her that support that she needed. And and in that moment, like, I knew that that was also going to be my story. And in that moment, I decided I did not want to be that. I didn't want that to be my story. I didn't want to, like, my mom flashed in front of me. I did not want to die at 44 Um, I didn't want my kids to have to go through all of this shit. And so it was really in that moment that deciding, like, I don't want to live this way anymore. Like, there's another way. There are people out there doing it another way. And, And so it was just taking those steps. You used the word steps. Did you... Did you find yourself attracted to a 12-step program or did were there other, other avenues that you explored? Yeah, so I actually picked up a book on how to quit drinking. It was Alan Carr's uh, The Easy Way to Quit Drinking. And I read it and I was just done. Like at the end, it says that you can have, you know, your final drink and I didn't need that final drink. I... I was just, my mindset had been flipped and it was interesting because two months prior to me quitting, I had done sober October and that month was super hard for me to just (laughs) quit drinking for 30 days because I went to two concerts and it was my birthday month, but I did it, but I, I had to use a shit ton of willpower. Whereas when I read the book, and I made the mindset flip, that's when everything has changed. And I never knew how easy it could be. And I I read a a meme that said, um, be careful, or once you just watch how quickly the universe moves once you've decided. And, and that's what happened. Like I just decided, and then literally the curtains were pulled back. Everything is clear. And I'm like, I got a lot of shit to do in life. Like, and what the hell have I been doing? And I actually spent um, about three or four months with a lot of shame and a lot of guilt for my years of drinking and all of the crap that it caused. And, And that's been part of, you know, me working through that. But I'm, you know, I'm providing myself that forgiveness and that grace. And that's, that's the thing I've got to work on daily, but I've done it and I've, I've changed and, and I just keep getting better. So it's, it's all worth it. (laughs) And you could, of course, argue if there are any skeptics out there say yeah yeah sure it's like a honeymoon period look at her she's just gone through through the the negative sides they're just ebbing off and now she sees that yeah wait and see until the first challenge comes ah she's hitting the bottle again um mm-hmm. and the chance is there okay there is uh, do you get cravings do you get so so It was interesting. Like those first three months, I didn't tell anybody that I had quit drinking because one, I didn't know if I was going to fail because I had failed so many times before. And then two, like, I didn't want anybody like judging me or, you know, when females quit drinking, it's immediately, are you pregnant? And, (laughs) you know, it's just that garbage that goes along with it. And it's like, no, like, and people don't understand like why you need this. And um, do I get cravings? Like, they are not the cravings that I had previously, like when I would take breaks or whatever, when I would need them. Like there, since I've made the mindset shift, there is literally nothing I could think of that would warrant me to want to pick up a drink, which would lead me to being hung over the next day and all of the crap that it causes. Mm-hmm. So, um, 
we we went traveling in December and we had kind of like this little snafu with our rental car and I was extremely like frustrated and I was like it wasn't so much I was craving a drink but it was it was an awareness of this would have caused me to drink oh yeah and yeah. and it's it's just more of an awareness that it's it's not really a craving that I have Oh, you're lucky. You're lucky. There is certainly there is there are some people out there where they the cravings can be brutal, mm-hmm. and I mean it is it it boils back down to to what gives what does alcohol actually give you, and right. it it numbs the pain. Now, if you think mm-hmm. what causes pain in your life, yeah, you've got the big things like grief and and loss, etc. Yeah. But it's the little things. It's the little things. Mm-hmm. Both of us are hitting the bottle nowadays here. Yeah. Uh, we are rehydrating. Um, yeah. But, you know, when you're thirsty, when you haven't rehydrated yourself, you are dry like a crisp. And, of course, yeah. your body suddenly says, ooh, I want, a, I want a drink. Now, what your body is saying is, I want water. What your yeah. brain is saying, oh, no. Can you imagine this cold Chardonnay where you've yeah. got the glistening condensation on the outside? Yeah. And just the smell of the alcohol coming through. That's what the alcoholic brain says. Hey, come on. Yeah. Yeah. Same with hunger. Same with loneliness. Same with yep. fatigue. The tired. Mm-hmm. Same when you're angry, when you're upset, emotionally upset. Um, mm-hmm. It's so easy to then fall back. And that's what our brain does. So for me, yeah. the biggest thing in my recovery was to actually pay attention to what my body really needs to show right. myself the love that I haven't given myself for such a long time. And that that is such a beautiful thing to actually look after yourself consciously, yeah. intentionally living a life where you give yourself a hug in the form yeah. of water, in the yeah. form in a moment, I'm going to have a nice breakfast. I might not yeah. be too hungry, but I actually want to treat my body and set it up so that I can go to work, kick ass, and and I'm in the right frame of mind. Not yeah. that my body needs to wonder, oh my God, there is no food. Are we starving? Mm-hmm. Are we? Will we ever eat again? Uh, mm-hmm. And you get this kind of, of reptilian brain responses that then lead to rather interesting decision-making down the line. Uh, mm-hmm. And it's just, you know, but it's that awareness that we need to to show that we need to demonstrate in our daily actions by living a life with the right habits. Mm-hmm. And I guess we two are really good in, in demonstrating that because we lived the wrong habits <laughs> such a long time. We are experts yeah. in how to not live a life. Right. <laughs> exactly. So no, you you and I we should have a medal actually. I think that, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> We've done well, all the bad that's, things. <laughs> that's why it's like so important for me to share my story uh, because I sat on this for a long time. But um, growing up, my mom always told me I was going to do big things, and so you know, after a couple of months, I have been you know talking to people and everything mm-hmm. like that, and and then people are telling me their stories and that, you know, that they're going through the same crap. And it's like, okay, this is something that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so important for me to get the word out there, because Mm -hmm. I need to people to know that I was a former train wreck. And if I can do this and make the change and (laughs) now be like, living the most fulfilling life that other people can do it too. Like there is nothing unique about me. Like I, I've got a shit story. You've got a shit story. We've all got our stories, but it's like, are you going to let that story control your entire life? Are you going to let that story like make all of the decisions for you? And, and I, and you know, just the title of your podcast, I wanted a different story. And, and so I wanted a story of traveling and of um, going on adventures with my kids, having those experiences. Like I wanted to remember all of it. And, and so it's just creating that we don't, 
it's not a life sentence. We do have the power and, and I'm just here as proof to show other people that they can do it too. Exactly. Oh, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And that's really has become your mission now, isn't it? Your, yeah. your, your vague dream became a vision. Then nowadays a mission because you're taking all the right steps. And indeed yeah. you're helping other people. Uh, if, if, if listeners and viewers here are thinking, damn, that resonates with me. I would love to, to get in touch with her. How can they do that? Yeah, I'm on Facebook at A Life Not Wasted. I have a private group for women to join, um, but you are welcome to add me on Facebook as well. Amber Miller, I'm sure there's only about three of those out there. Um, it's pretty common well, last name. Exactly. But yeah, um, yeah, so that's that's how you can get a okay. hold of me. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. and. It is so important, this connection. It's so important because there is, there, is, there is the shame, there is the guilt, there is the hopelessness of the situation. It looks like such an insurmountable challenge to stop drinking. And until someone holds your hand and, and says, you know, one day at a time, and, and you know, what is necessary right now? And there are different yeah. things, different challenges uh, once you are down the line. And, and it is where we're talking to others that have been through it is so important. So the life coaches, the, 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 the people like you who are saying, wow, I, if I can live now such a beautiful life, why can we not leave that as a legacy to others and demonstrate and showcase how to live? Now, there are nuances that, that your your path is maybe a bit different than others, but ultimately here we are, uh, different gender, different background, different, you name it, uh, yet we are actually pretty much aligned due to the trauma that we have been through, due to the steps that we have taken. And by, by living this intentional life, it's like a brother and sisterhood uh, yeah. where you actually see, wow, this is, it's actually not weird that you're not drinking. It is weird that you have been drinking and that you have been literally wasted um, for such a long time. The blur of your twenties, as you described it, yep, I can go with that. Um, that is for me was the thirties where I, um, yeah, where I worked incredibly hard and then played very hard and mm -hmm. yeah, now. No, and, and the more I talk to people, and especially women, it's they don't feel like when when you're in the the hell of it, they don't feel worthy of a better life. Mm -hmm. And that's where I'm here to call bullshit because everybody is worthy of living a beautiful, happy life. Mm -hmm. And the thing was, is I thought I was happy in my 20s. And, and I was, and I have a lot of great times from them. But I could have had a much better time had I known what was on this side of the mm -hmm. fence. And so the thing that I want to do is to, you know, like, I, I always tell my women that I want to pour gasoline on their spark. And I want to show them that they are worthy of an amazing life and that you don't have to fake being happy. And, you know, like just it, it's all like, yeah, they, they just don't have to fake it. Like this isn't faking <laughs> it. I used to look at peak pictures of before and afters of people that had quit drinking. And I used to wonder, are they really that happy or, you know, uh, are they bullshitting me? <laughs> and, and no, it is like, they, they are that happy. Like, and I wanted to be them and now I am that person. And so, you know, people, people see me and like, I was, 
I was vibrant before and now it's like, I am like shooting beams Uh, out, like get in my presence because I will lift you up. I don't have time for excuses, but I will uh, help you change your shit. uh, (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) I wrote my steps to sobriety where, where, which is sort of um, a bit, a lot of vignettes and and part of my story, but more importantly, uh, showing in the first half of the book, a, this is, this is what alcohol does and what it did to me and the steps I took to to get better. And then the second part of the book is all about uh, living a life so beautiful and, and accepting there will be challenges. And, yeah. and I go through heaps of action plans for, for, okay, you will have depression, like it or lump it, a one in three chance in your life. You might as well learn a bit about it and, 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 and prepare yourself. Anxiety attacks yeah. or the financial strain or et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to go through all these plans there. But I handed that book to, uh, to an AA person who was sort of high up in the AA, and he gave it to his friend. And I sort of said, yeah, what do you think? What do you think? And the friend said, oh, no, no, he hated it. It's so positive. Life is not positive. It is, it is, that's rubbish. It's so, so sugar-coated. And I thought, but hang on, this is the life that I'm living. Honestly, this is truly, this is not bullshit. Yeah, no, no, he doesn't believe you. He doesn't believe you. <laughs> and that's-, that's, that's the thing is people want to live in victim mentality. Yeah. And, and that's why they keep up with the excuses and everything like that. Yeah. Once you once you decide to take ownership for your happiness, yeah. that's when everything changes. So I took ownership of the fact that what my <laughs> drinking was doing and now I take ownership of whether and like what I let in, who I let into my circle and what's affecting me. And Absolutely. yeah, like it's, it's not all bull crap. So like, and, and I want other people to feel this good. And, and that's why this, this message is so important. Oh, exactly. I couldn't agree more. And Choco Willing, if you're listening, Choco, uh, your book, Extreme Ownership, uh, is is a Bible for me. So here you go. This is when you were saying ownership, to to actually own what is happening around you. And it is such an important and empowering thing to take responsibility, to... And not be responsible for the for world hunger and 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 then beat yourself up and think oh my god I'm such a bad person no 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 you're taking responsibility where you say what are the actions that maybe have contributed to mm-hmm. whatever scenario there is and uh, where it's a kind of like the step four in 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 the twelve step program where you have a very honest and brutal inventory of what's going on your resentment your anger your negative emotions etc cetera, etc cetera. and that is where ownership and taking action comes in that's where yeah. you, where your your humility comes in your integrity. Integrity is defined as what you're doing when no one is watching. And it's that taking ownership to yourself, which then leads to accepting your faults, maybe Mm -hmm. dealing with them, maybe improving them, uh, celebrating the positive things, which we are so bad in. Uh, so it is it now is. I celebrate everything yeah <laughs> it's you know and and I could have let that generational trauma yeah. you yeah. know be the reason why I kept drinking oh my mom passed away when yeah. I was 22 so now I'm gonna be a lifelong drunk like mm. that makes zero sense and so you know getting to that point where I did take ownership and mm. we are all in the spot that we are in because of the choices that we've made. And, you know, that, that applies to probably like 95% of people. And Mm -hmm. so once you take that ownership and you start surrounding yourself with, you know, different people and you, you decide that you want to make that change and you start making those Mm -hmm. 
changes in steps and things like that, that's when everything changes. And now adversity is always going to happen. Now, how are you going to respond to it? Are you going to respond to it and let that be a teaching moment? And, you know, or are you going to sit there and drown in that and let that be your excuse from everything else? And I I heard something the other day that failure is just a state of mind until you let it become the truth. And so it's just kind of like, you know, I had failed all of those other times, but I decided that I didn't want to fail again. And, oh, and so that it, I'm no longer a failure. <laughs> like I made it to the other side. <laughs> and you guys out there decide how the next chapter of your book plays out. It is mm-hmm. you write a story. You have got the power to do so. It is um, exactly, and you can either take ownership and action and do something about your life, or you can remain the victim. That is, these are all choices. And guess Mm -hmm. what? Every second, and how many are there? 88,000 seconds in a day. Every second, you have got uh, a choice. You have, you can make a choice towards Mm -hmm. eating that one leaf of salad. It doesn't yeah. matter what salad, what green is. You have eaten that one leaf, and mm-hmm. that is already more than you had done before, where you had mm-hmm. no leaf, or that you actually drink a glass of water, or mm-hmm. that you decide today, no, nah, I actually don't think I want to drink, yeah. and we'll see, we'll see what tomorrow brings. But today, I actually don't want to drink. How cool mm-hmm. is that? How cool yeah. is that? And maybe instead of, of, you know, using the anger and resentment, you might actually say, look, I just give myself a break now and maybe treat myself to a hot pool session. Uh, if you, if you don't have, or it doesn't matter, a walk in the, in the, in, in the woods somewhere. It's breaking um, those habits. Exactly. Because, because the habits are, our daily lives. Mm -hmm. So if you want to change something, anything in your life, disrupt that pattern and, and create a new habit. You know, if you, if you're triggered by certain things, go deep and dissect that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, if this triggers me, then, then I'm going to not do that thing. And I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. Now for me, that trigger was everything in my life. Like I, I drank for all of the things, like it it didn't matter what it was. And so, um, for me, like that, a big step was reading that book Mm -hmm. and, and flipping my mindset that, no, I don't need alcohol to, to do this. And then, and then after I read that book, then it was just continuing to build on that. Okay, like what are what are the podcasts that I can listen to? Mm. Who are the people that I can surround myself yeah. with? And um, yeah, in, in speaking of surrounding myself with, I guess I forgot to mention like one of the other places that you can find me is that I'm part of a nonprofit called One Life Fully Lived. And recently we have um, started a mastermind of sorts for people that are in recovery and want to take life to the next level because sometimes people get into recovery and they're like, okay, now what? For some people, everything isn't rainbows and sunshine. And so, and so the purpose of our group is to show people like how exciting life can be and what the possibilities are and, and, and how to, you know, start making financial progress and things like that. So, Mm -hmm. um, that group is the recovery mastermind with one life fully lived too. So. Nice. And guys, look down there into the description of the video and the podcast. You will find Amber's links in there. And it is a life fully lived. It's such a, such a gift that we then can pass on to the next generation. Um, I think that is the most exciting bit for me. Like you, I, 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 I had so much shame and guilt. And nowadays, 
that shame and guilt still from London wants to come through. But at the same token, I look at what I have achieved in my relationships with my children, in my relationship with my wife, how we model conflict and conflict resolution. Yeah, It's beautiful. It's absolutely I, beautiful. And I know I've left a legacy there already for my boys that is that I can be proud of. And yeah. that's the beautiful thing. To actually be proud of myself is right. something that in the past I was unable to, to do Absolutely. that, regardless how my achievements, how high my achievements were, that I'm a doctor, that I'm that I'm a high functioning kind of guy. Ah, uh, no, it deep inside I consider myself a failure. Nowadays, I accept that I'm a sinner and a saint, and yeah. that I that I am who I am, warts and all. And yeah. I, I try to strengthen the good sides and I try to deal with the bad sides, which are still there. Uh, so yeah. if we can if we can model that, um, uh, that is really, really beautiful. I read, so, I, I read something the other day that said, we're not afraid of dying, we're afraid of living. <laughs> and like that just struck a chord with me because I was afraid of living. I thought I was living. But I was afraid of living and, and we're so afraid of what other people are going to think. And, and that's what keeps us small. And once you can just let go of that, like one of my big fears was when I quit drinking is that I was going to lose all my friends and that like I wasn't going to be awesome anymore. And it turns out people like me even better now that, you know, I quit drinking and I'm even more cooler. And so it's, it's, you know, those bullshit fears that keep us small. And now I feel like I am actually living because <laughs> I'm waking up in the morning with intention and purpose. And my heart feels full when I can help somebody else and I can make that mm -hmm. impact. And I just, I can't imagine, you know, what my life would have been like. Actually, I know exactly what my life would have been like if, if I would have continued drinking. <laughs> but this new story is so much cooler. And, and I get to write whatever I want. <laughs> and so, you know, earlier I had mentioned something about how when my mom passed, I thought somebody else should fix it. You know, somebody else should change everything. And it's like, no, I have to be that person. I'm that person with the experience. I'm the one that has compassion for people. And, you know, I don't look at other people that are drinking and think I'm better than them. My heart actually goes out to them because I know like what's going through their head. I've already been through that. And there's a lot of people in my life that are never going to know how good this feels that they're going to be trapped their entire lives in this bullshit story of alcohol. And, and so it's just me, you know, I've, I've got to put myself out there. I can't care what other people think. And, <laughs> and I've got work to do. <laughs> <laughs> and let's do it. And we're doing it here right now because we are sharing our insights, we are laying open our our journeys. And mm -hmm. I think that is so beautiful because that hopefully will put a spark into someone or plant the seed, shall I say, yeah. uh, to to think and to say, hmm, maybe I can do it. Yeah. And it's just, and I strongly advise you all out there, if if people like me can get their shit together, you guys have a real, real fair chance. If Amber yeah. gets her shit together, come on. <laughs> Two real numb story. nuts here. Two numb nuts. Yes. Who, are, who, who would have not believed had you yeah. had you told us uh, a few years ago that we would be nowadays sitting here and having that discussion. Mm -hmm. I, I, I certainly would have looked in your eyes and I would have thought you got to be joking. Uh, and I would have come up with 20,000 excuses why this will never happen. That guess what? Me. Yeah, guess what? Once you throw the excuses to the side and actually don't take no for an answer and actually just take that little tiny step, that little baby step, 
And then suddenly yeah. take another little baby step and then, damn it, before you blink, you have walked a thousand miles and you uh-huh. find yourself on a path that is so rich and fulfilling. It's yes. bloody gorgeous. Yeah, and, it, so. and it's what makes life worth living. But it's kind of funny because um, back like probably about six years ago when I was the height of my train wreckness, if that's a word, I just made it up. But anyway, sounds good. <laughs> It's good. I was a train wreck. And I used to tell people that I was good. I was a life coach, like I was in training for being a life coach, because I was I was filling my resume (laughs) with all of this crap. And and it's like, you know, I look back and I wonder, why did I have to go through all of that shit? And now I'm just embracing it. And I know that I had to go through that so I can feel and understand what everybody else is going through. And so that way I can throw down the rope and help them. And, you know, I used to say, well, if I can just help one person and now that's crap, like I can help a shit ton more people. So it's, it's getting the word out there that me and you, like, yeah, if if we can change, everybody else can too. They've Absolutely. just got to want it. <laughs> Amber, it was such an honor to have you. This 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 bringer of light, this this kind of ball of energy from the Midwest on my show. <laughs> uh, because yeah, you're gorgeous and your Thank message you. is so, so, so true, and it needs to be heard. And so many people out there just wouldn't believe it uh, when they hear it the first time so maybe we have to repeat it again and again and again and just yeah remember what i told you yesterday you can live a great life today yes you can live a great life so yeah take that step make that decision one decision after the other one little step after the other and you guys can do it so amber thank you so much for being my my thank guest thank you for having me uh, this is such a fun <laughs> indeed the same here and you guys out there one day at a time one decision at a time you guys can do it okay look after yourself bye <laughs> <laughs> dream on, dream on.